Welcome to today's um, webinar on DMP um, data management planning lessons from Europe. My name's Liz Stokes. I'm coming to you from the University of Technology, Sydney, um, and I am um, part of the skilled workforce team of the Australian Research Data Commons. Uh, as we begin, I would like to acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation and pay my respects to elders both past and present, recognising them as traditional custodians of the land on, on which I'm standing um, here. Our guest speaker today, Sarah Jones from the Digital Curation Centre uh, in the UK, um, is joining us from the traditional lands of the Boon people of the Kulin Nations, where um, she's um, visiting the University of Monash Caulfield campus in Melbourne. I'd like to pay respect to any First Nations people who are present here today and um, acknowledge that uh, Aboriginal sovereignty has not been ceded in this country. So um, on with our program today. Um, so I'm very excited to introduce Sarah Jones to you, who has been working as part of her work. She's the Assistant Director of the Digital Curation Centre and she has been um, involved in data management planning on a lot of different fronts, um, most um, specifically with her work in the DMP online. Um, Sarah is going to share with us some uh, lessons from Europe and what's been happening with um, DMP infrastructure and machine actionable, actionable initiatives. Okay, Sarah, I'm ready for you now. So, so thanks very much for the intro, Liz. What I'm going to do is talk about data management planning. Um, it's an area, as Liz mentioned, that I do a fair amount of work on um, and I'll reflect on what's happening in Europe. So I'm based at the DCC in the UK, but we do a lot of work in a European context. These slides are actually already online if you want to grab the slides, but they will be shared um, afterwards as well. So I wanted to begin by just setting the scene. I don't know um, to what extent you're all familiar with data management plans, so I'll give a bit of introductory context about what plans are, um, kind of the drivers for these and, and some of the, the recent developments. And then what I'm going to focus on is talking about some of the trends from Europe, how that's informing our work and potentially could be useful in your context too. So first off, I thought I'd start with a definition of a DMP. Um, at a very basic level, a DMP is a formal document which outlines how research data is going to be handled both during the project and, and after. And certainly in the UK and the US context, data management plans have often um, come up when people are applying for funding. They're something that goes in as part of a grant application. What we're seeing is that people want to um, make sure that there's proper benefits that come from data management plans and that it's not this kind of static textual document. So you can see a, a second definition here that we're talking about dynamic inventories of research methods and outputs that evolve over time. And I think some of the work that's going on um, in Australia kind of is more aligned with this definition. You're often having um, tools that are more like data management systems that are really capturing everything about the, the output being created. And then a, a third definition you'll see here, um, this comes from the, um, the FAIR, Turning FAIR into Reality report, um, and this talks about DMPs being active um, and enabling information exchange across different tools within the system, and that we tie the DMP to its implementation. So really what we're seeing in terms of the definitions is that this kind of machine actionable agenda is coming more to the fore and that people are thinking about data management plans beyond just being a document to something that is tied to the implementation of a plan that evolves. Um, so the vision for data management, machine actionable data management plans is really going beyond this static document into something that is a lot more useful to the different stakeholders involved. And in these bullets here, you can see some of the, the data better um, and discover data more easily because the DMP is really the first indication of what data is going to be created. Um, having a, a kind of machine actionable DMP can help infrastructure providers to plan their resources. They know what the requirements are in terms of storage, for example, and can plan the capacity that's needed. 
So it's really helping people provide more effective data services and actually having something that's more machine actionable can help funders to monitor their data related activities as well. There have been a couple of papers that I would point to. Um, a couple of years ago, we did a workshop where we tried to gather requirements for machine actionable DMPs. And since then, we've done um, a paper on 10 principles for, for MA DMPs. So if you're interested in this area, there's, there's some background literature. There are a number of drivers for data management plans, and I think these vary in each context. So I mentioned earlier that in the UK and the USA, the vendor requirements are really coming to the fore. That's the way most people hear about data management plans. It's usually when they're doing their grant applications. But universities are also putting expectations out around DMPs. Um, and I think particularly in the Australian context, that seems to be the biggest driver. And there, it means that the priority can be quite different for different institutions. It might be about risk management. It might be about their capacity planning and making sure that, you know, they actually provide the right kind of environment for the different research projects. Or people might be completing a DMP to achieve another goal. So in Australia, you seem to link your DMP to the storage allocation often. Um, one of the big drivers that came up in um, a university in Singapore, they actually don't release the funds for, from different research projects until a DMP is completed. So the research office has quite a strong mandate there. So it, that's why researchers are engaging. They want their funds released. And also it might be to try and um, engender good practice. So often data management plans are starting to be created by um, HDR or PhD students um, as a way to try and get good practice in early on. In case people aren't familiar with a data management plan, um, it's typically something that's covering the whole life cycle of the data. So what's going to be created, how that data is going to be created and managed. So what standards will be used, how the data will be um, stored and backed up. There are usually questions around ethics and intellectual property, largely in terms of any restrictions on the data, any sensitivities or um, restrictions on sharing. And then the, the DMP usually covers the longer term plans for sharing and preservation as well. There are a number of tools available for data management plans already. Um, so ourselves at the DCC, we offer DMP online and in the States there's a tool called DMP tool. And um, we actually came together and, and joined up our code base. So we have a common um, open source code base that we run each of our services from. There are also other tools in the European context like RDM Organizer, which comes out of Germany. Um, and in Australia, you, you have several tools too, like Redbox, which is offered by QCIF or the Research Data Manager at the University of Queensland. Um, I think it's probably about a year ago now, we set up a site called Active DMPs, where we're trying to pull together the different requirements for data management plans and um, the tooling specifically and also to record the different initiatives that are going on. So I'm conscious that we don't have um, the CSIRO um, RD planner tool in this list. So if there are other activities you're aware of, um, this is actually, you can update it yourself by uh, submitting a pull request on GitHub. So please share information about other tools or correct any mistakes in this. So I've been here on placement for, I think about four, five weeks now, um, and I've learned a little bit about the Australian context. Um, and these are just my reflections. Um, you seem to have a much less formal funder requirements um, steer here. There is a code, um, but it, you know, it doesn't mandate the MPs. There's an encouragement in the, the kind of guidelines associated with the code, but it, you don't have very heavy drivers from funders. So it's typically the institutional perspective driving your DMPs here. And as I alluded to before, I think your tools are quite different to what we have in Europe because they have a much broader coverage. You are often talking around um, data management as a whole concept and having tools that cover, you know, the allocation of storage and link to um, lab notebooks and have integrations with that wider ecosystem rather than just having something that's about the plan. 
I think that's a really positive step. I think there's a lot that we could learn from you as well as you learning lessons from Europe. In discussions with a number of the tool providers, um, the key piece of work that seems to still be going on in your context is the end of the life cycle. So once you've got all your data in your system, um, figuring out how to select what to keep and how to publish that data and link up with your repository infrastructure. And I did a blog where I've made some reflections on um, the Australian context um, and yeah, ideas um, of how we could potentially collaborate further and I'll pick up on that again at the end. So what I want to do now is talk about some of the emerging trends in data management planning, um, specifically looking at what's going on in, in Europe and elsewhere. So as I mentioned, for, for ourselves in the UK and for the USA, the funder requirements is a very big driver. But globally, there are lots of funders that are asking for DMPs. It's not just UK and Europe. Um, this list isn't comprehensive, but it's just to show you the breadth of, of funders. Um, it's from all different areas of research, um, all the different kind of disciplinary funders, as well as big national ones like NSF or the Academy of Finland. And um, what we're seeing is that the requirements from funders are starting to change. So traditionally, they would always ask for a DMP at the application stage, but increasingly funders are shifting their policies. So they either require a DMP during the project or they expect the DMP to be a living document that's updated. So NERC in the UK, for example, they have a very basic requirement, literally, I think three or four questions at the application stage. And then they expect a full DMP to be written in conjunction with a designated data center once um, an award has been made. And the European Commission, they don't actually ask for DMP at the application stage, although some details can be submitted about the data plans. They view the DMP as a deliverable and they expect that it's something that's updated at least at project review time, but whenever um, significant changes arise. And with the European I think because it's a deliverable, that's changed people's attitudes to DMPs. A lot more people are publishing their DMPs because they expect to publish their deliverables. And I think that's actually quite a positive shift because if information's available, there's more we can do with it. The other shift we're seeing, um, particularly in terms of funder policies, is that the onus is starting to be placed on universities a lot more. So in 2011, um, in the UK, the EPSRC, which is our Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council, they released a, quite a different policy, quite groundbreaking, because they weren't saying um, that researchers needed to develop DMPs, that's the typical policy statement in the UK. They said that the research organisation has a responsibility to support data management and that uh, uni should ensure DMPs are in place um, and maintained by grant holders but really what they were looking for was a response from the institution not from the individual researcher and they expected institutions to show that they had policies and infrastructure and support for data management and that led to the growth of a, a lot of data services within UK universities. More recently, our Arts and Humanities Research Council has updated its policy um, and it has um, a similar onus on institutions. So now when a um, research organisation is submitting a grant, they have to tick this um, statement which confirms a whole series of things that they agreed to. And I've put a basic summary of, of some of those in this quote. Um, they have a sign that the institution is able to store the data appropriately during the life cycle of the grant. Um, that the relevant people have been consulted, as in, you know, the research team have spoken with the library or IT services, and that the plan that's been put in has been considered and agreed by the institution. So that's quite a big step. Um, and, you know, it, it makes sure that, you know, could put the institution at risk if there are things in those plans that they haven't yet. Um, but this, again, is driving um, new approaches within UK universities they're starting to more proactively check data management plans before they go, go in um, as part of grant agreements. And another funder um, in Norway, Research Council in Norway, they um, have introduced a policy. And again, this is expecting um, the university takes more control, really, that they will check the MPs and make sure they're made openly available. So it's, it's only days. Um, for these policy 
same certainly the HSE and Research Council Norway ones. Um, we're seeing some of the bigger institutions more proactively responding, but um, I think it will take a while for a shift there because this is a lot of um, extra work and responsibility on institutions. I think what we've seen so far in light of this is that institutions are starting to use these policies or these shifts to um, make a case for more support for resources internally so that they can provide this support. The other shift we're seeing in terms of the coverage of data management plans um, is that there is a need to cover more than just data. So Welcome Trust issued new guidelines in 2017 that asked for an outputs management plan rather than the data management plan. And they ask that this OMP covers the data sets, any original software, new materials like antibodies or cell lines or reagents, um, and also that it considers the IP. So what's going to be patented or copyrighted and what kind of confidential know-how there is that's going to come out of the grant. The EPSRC um, has a requirement in some of its programmes for software management plans too. Um, I think it's really uh, what I would like to see is that we start to broaden out in the way that, that Welcome Trust has. That when we're thinking about a data management plan, we're not just thinking about the data because actually it's kind of meaningless in isolation. You need the code as well. You need to know, you need to have all of those different outputs and that wider context. I want to reflect on um, some results we got from a survey we did um, in the European context through Open Air, which is one of our big infrastructure projects, and the Third Age Expert Group. We looked at the Horizon 2020 DMPs. So we did a survey, I think we got a couple of hundred responses um, that were from researchers who were PIs on Horizon 2020 awards, as well as um, support staff within institutions that were um, working with these research groups. And I was really surprised that we got 60% positive response um, to whether a DMP is useful or not. Um, I expected a much lower figure because the Horizon 2020 template is really quite long and complicated. But these quotes that I've, I've highlighted here show that even when it is like that, people can still find it quite a useful exercise. So there is this concern that it's administrative, but on reflection, people have found it useful or they found that it's a bit balanced. You know, it was frustrating, it was cumbersome in parts, but they actually found that that reflection on the potential issues and how to address them within their project was a valuable um, activity. So I think it's actually good that people are finding the process useful. And I think what we need to learn from this is that we need to make sure the DMPs we have um, aren't a burden. So we need to keep them as short and simple and um, as kind of um, tailored to the local context as possible so that we're not just asking for various information, we're actually using that information as much as we can and pre-inputting pre information where we can too. One of the concerns that came out of um, that survey we did was that language is a real barrier. So in um, the European Commission context and under Horizon 2020, their DMP template um, is essentially structured around FAIR and the respondents of the survey mentioned four terms that were unclear to them and you can see the primary ones in the word cloud here and I think sometimes we don't realise that a lot of the terms we bandy around are really not clear to researchers so asking them how their data is going to be interoperable or asking them what ontologies they're going to use can leave them confused and I really like this quote at the bottom um, one of the respondents has said that without the help of their Swedish National Data Service, they wouldn't have been able to do the DMP. So I think this shows that, A, we need to think about how we um, define the DMP to make sure it is clear, but also we do need support services to help people understand and complete those DMPs in some cases. The other thing that came out quite strongly is that the priorities for support from the users were really to simplify the DMP. So we gave them a whole series of options that they could um, prioritize. And the things that came out at the top were suggesting relevant standards, giving example answers, providing more drop downs based on what's good practice for a given discipline or more disciplinary guidance and tailoring. So people are really wanting these recommendations. They don't want a free text box. They want to know, you know, 
I'm in, you know, engineering, what's the relevant standard? Give me some clear pointers as to what I should be doing or what's good practice for my field. So we're interested in the things like pre-filling information or sharing information with other services, but they they came lower down in the priorities for end users. Um, so I think even though that's it makes it all more useful, I think we do need to make sure that some of the basics are in place, you know, decent templates and good guidance um, go a long way. Another trend we're seeing is that universities are requiring data management plans from um, HDRs or PhD students. Um, and this is really to try and make sure that we have good practice early on in research careers. And one of the things that's come, come out that's working really nicely about this is that often universities are asking supervisors to review the DMP. Um, and that's a way to try and get PIs and more senior academics aware of good practice in research data management and sharing. So they're not asking them to um, you know, complete the DMP themselves, but they're kind of training them via the back door. There was a, a whole discussion on the research data and GIS mail list about this a couple of years ago. And actually that just re got reinvigorated just a couple of days ago. Um, I think it was Anna Clement or somebody um, had asked you know, for updates. So there's currently a discussion thread going on about this. And I mentioned that more DMPs are also being published nowadays, um, certainly under Horizon 2020, because it's a deliverable projects are, seem quite keen to make their DMPs available. Some publish them via tools like DMP online, others put them in repositories like Zenodo or publish in journals. Um, and I think it is good if we can encourage people to share their DMPs early and, and openly because that enables us to reuse more of the information to inform service delivery or, or to, to help the discovery of, of data sets. It also um, helps to provide examples of good practice for others to learn from. And I know a lot of universities in the UK and elsewhere are trying to have libraries of, of good practice DMPs as a training resource. So I want to close by thinking about what you can do and where you can learn more. Um, and I think if you're engaging in data management plans, um, I think it's good to offer a range of services. You don't want to just offer you know, one thing, one tool or one approach because researchers will vary and will want different types of support. So I've given this example from Stanford University, um, obviously because it's in the States, they have a lot of funder requirements. So they have information on the different funding agency requirements. They've got some good practice guidelines. They have an online tool, FAQs and workshops. And they also offer a DMP review service so people can submit their plan and get feedback. And I think it's good to offer this kind of range of different um, types of support. I think the data management plan can also be a good talking point. Um, this slide comes from um, Maria Lisa Kuzniemi at the University of Helsinki. And there they kind of have a RDM consulting um, service where they bring together different stakeholders from the institutional services, but they also you know, will help research teams think about the best ways to manage their data. And it's a way for them to raise awareness of um, the different expectations that a researcher might have to meet from their funder or publisher or elsewhere but also to help them understand um, the different areas like research ethics and to, to point them to relevant services from the institution or elsewhere. And sometimes that um, discussion can be a really good way of, of actually fleshing out the DMP. Another approach I really like, um, there was a project in the US called DART, which is DMPs as a research tool. This was a three year IMLS funded project and what they did, they developed um, essentially an analytic rubric to review data management plans. So they looked at what should be covered and talked about, you know, what is a good answer, what's a reasonable answer, and what, what essentially is a poor answer, what kind of gaps need to be addressed. And they um, mined a whole series of PMPs to pull out good examples and, and poor ones and use that to analyze, you know, where different research communities were at and to use that to inform their service delivery in, in the different academic libraries that were part of this. 
a group of um, institutions in the UK and across Europe have kind of copied this approach um, in terms of developing rubrics. So we have um, evaluation rubrics for various um, UK and European funders, and they're often used by institutions to try and um, review DMPs and to give pointers. And you can see information about this online. I mentioned before about sharing examples of DMPs, um, and there are already some out there that you can use for inspiration. LIBA, which is the League of European Research Universities, has a catalogue of data management plans on Bonodo, um, and they're using a rubric to evaluate these plans and to give pointers as to what's, you know, strength and weakness of different plans. And through tools like DMP Online, you can also um, provide kind of catalogues. I've noted here the different visibility settings we have. Our DMPs are uh, private by default, but organized or individuals can choose to make them visible within their institution. So you have a kind of internal library for your university, or they can also make them public. And the other thing that I think is really important is connecting with peers um, and sharing information with, with others who are, are kind of involved in data management plans. And I wanted to give the example of how we do this through DMP online. So we have um, regular user groups where we bring people together and we talk about what features they need and kind of flesh out the idea for new features um, and consult with them on how we develop that. We have um, various socials around those um, user groups as well. So the picture in the middle here is actually we went out throwing last time, uh, which was a good way to vent frustration and to, to build rapport across the community. I think that's really important because we want people to be able to approach us with any kind of issue or a small niggle so that we can try and address that within the school. Um, we obviously have help desk and various ways for people to get in touch with us. We have monthly drop-ins. Um, and one thing we've been doing is a knowledge exchange. So we have a blog post every month that comes from somebody in the community about how they're um, supporting DMP. Piece. And in our drop-ins, we're also having them give a, a brief chat so we can start that discussion and, and promote um, sharing across institutions about how they do this work. Um, we've got a newsletter as well. You're welcome to sign up and, and look at the stuff that comes out of the UK if it's of interest to you. There is also an ARDC, the MP Interest Group, and this is to enable information exchange across all of those working on DMPs. So in a similar vein to what we do in the UK. And this connects up Australian and, and New Zealand initiatives with other international efforts. And I think one of the things that would be useful to discuss on this call um, is what you want to see from this group. So it could provide information and links to the RDA and other global initiatives happening in the DMP space. It could offer that kind of monthly knowledge exchange so that you can all share what you're doing and learn from one another or it could provide training and guidance resources. So it's really for you to steal what you want from this community, and I'd encourage you to kind of put your ideas forward to ARDC. There are also international initiatives through um, RDA. There's an active data management plans interest group, which is a kind of umbrella group to look at what's happening in terms of DMPs globally and promote coordination. And that interest group spun out a couple of working groups, one that was about developing common standards for DMPs, and one that was about exposing DMPs. So taking certain information from DMPs, like storage um, volumes, and sharing that with relevant information, and developing um, essentially an understanding of the different use cases, who needs access to what content and when. You do have two Australian co-chairs of these groups, so Peter, um, Peter Niche from um, Melbourne has been involved in the Common Standards work and Catherine Unsworth um, from CSIRO in the Exposing DMPs group. So I would encourage you to reach out through them, but also to join these RTA groups um, and get involved in the work. Because the Research Data Alliance is coming to Australia next March, um, I personally think it would be really interesting to do a co-located event on data management plans. 
I've been really impressed to see what tools you have in your context. And I think there's a lot of ways that we could exchange um, internationally. It'd be good to understand the different requirements landscapes. Obviously, you're not driven as much by funder policies, um, but you do have different user groups and community needs. So it'd be good to share, you know, what are the key features or bits of functionality you are adding to each tool? What are the trends that are emerging? Um, I think it would be good for us to share information on, on the different tools we have. So um, potentially where it's feasible sharing code, but just learning about the functionality in each tool, what the development roadmap is, trying to promote tech exchange so that developers have a forum to, to share ideas and have a wider sounding board. And I think there's lots of ways that we could um, explore different options for global collaboration. So around things like the common standard, or integration between different tools, DMP tools with other services, creating registries of DMPs or different peer support networks. So if people are interested in, in trying to coordinate an event, please do reach out to me. That's, that's something that I'll be discussing with a number of people and trying to get set up. So this, um, if you haven't seen it already, is details about the next RDA plenary. It will be in Melbourne on the 18th to 20th of March. Um, so the co, I can't remember what days of the week that is, the co-located events are usually the day before and after. And the final thing I wanted to flag, if you are delivering services and looking at doing data management services, um, we actually have a MOOC um, that's starting in, oh my God, not too many days from now. Um, and this is about RDM services as a whole. It does have a, uh, sections on data management planning, but it's about the broader services at the institution. It's run by the DCC together with Research Data Netherlands. Um, so if you're interested, by all means, sign up and join in the discussions. And that, I think, was the final slide. Um, so I can hand back to Liz. Okay. Um, I am going to um, show, uh, I'll show some of my screen, but I'm going to bring it over to the, uh, over to that. Um, and move that along oh no we can just stay here for the moment so um oh but if i show my screen then you get to see my terrible google doc that um i've collated from the questions that people have brought together before i'm just going to embrace this on the yeah. um, on the wing here um and so these were so here we've got some of the questions that have come in as people registered and Sarah, I think that you have your presentation has answered quite a few of those, but I thought I would just like to highlight um, a couple of the more practical questions that came through. So, if I might um, ask you one, how um, I thought this question about um, uh, what are some ways to keep data management plans down to a manageable size for researchers? What are some common redundant or less useful questions like what um, when we're talking about yeah. optimizing these um, what kind of advice would you have yeah so i think um one piece of advice is thinking about when you're asking for the dmp and what people can realistically answer at each stage so i do like the NERC approach that it's very minimal um, at the grant application stage and then all the dmp wants an award to be made because um Really, at that early grant application stage, you only really need to know a few key things, like is there a large volume of data, are there key sensitivities, have people costed in relevant support, um, and it's kind of later on when the project's underway, when people are actually starting to create the data that you really need to think about, the best way to create that data, the relevant standards, you know, and how that data is going to be shared so you can make sure any agreements and enable that sharing. Um, what typically happens, and I think this is why sometimes there's a lot of resistance to DMPs, people are given all the questions right from the off, and half the time they won't have the answers till later, because, you know, they either aren't starting the work yet, or it's very early days and they haven't determined exactly um, what will be shared or how or where. So I think trying to um, have the DMP evolve with more questions coming in at a later stage is, is a good way to do it. Um, and I also, one thing that I've been struck by here is that you, because your data management tools are connected to other systems, 
you pre-populate things a lot more, which is definitely good. The more you can have pre-filled um, and have researchers either just correct um, or you know not have to complete, um, the better. Because if there's empty boxes and you already have the information somewhere else, that is really frustrating. True, uh, and there are also some some questions as we can see there about um, some ways to keep. Oh, sorry, um, about pre-population. Um, another question that's just come in from the chat now is: Have you come across DMP tools that are integrated with other research management services? At the University of Canberra, we use a research management system called Pure. It's from Elsevier. Yeah. I'm keen. To, I'm keen to know if there are tool, tools that are already integrated or DMP tools that can speak with other tools? Yeah, so the, the three examples from Australia, um, the um, RD Planner at CSIRO, Redbox, that's from now, QCIF, and UQRDM, are all integrated with other tools that are often within a given institutional context. So um, uh, uh, the UQRDM is at the University of Queensland, obviously, and CSIRO is within their own um, an organizational context. Um, the QCIF tool, I don't think they have a pure integration, um, but they've been connecting with different lab notebooks and other, other things. Um, I can't think of any tool that's connected already with pure, but there have been, there are tools that are, um, you know, working across different systems and exchanging information. But at the date, they seem to be mostly within one given institutional context, although the QCIF tool is um, open source. So you could reuse integrations that others have done. Um, can I also ask another question about, um, uh, let's see, um, I'll just go over to the chat box. Um, yeah. Some um, has a comment about, I like the idea of a tool agnostic working group that would help an institution to drive the agenda on support and simplicity of a chosen tool recommendations could then be used as a case for change. Um, uh, Christopher, I have just got, um, uh, my brain's not working, so I've forgotten where you're coming from. Um, but I, um, uh, you say that you have always presented the DMP tool as something that is a working document and can be revisited over time, but the machine actionable concept shows great value and therefore more engagement over the life of the project um, so yeah ah Deakin it's Deakin University thank you Chris uh, yeah okay um, yeah I think I, I think um, actually having tool agnostic working groups as much as possible is is best um, and the RDA groups try and work like that so it's not so even though you know like I'm a code chair of one of those groups I don't do it for DMP online, I'm trying to look broader than, than the tool per se, because I think there's a lot in common across all of these tools. And if we think about the, the underlying requirements, um, it helps the sector as a whole more. Mm. Can I, um, I'm going to bring in a question now, who's made a yeah. comment that it's definitely good to make DMPs as small and frictionless as possible, but it's, def it's difficult to change the format slash template once created or to make completely ad hoc DMPs. So how do you balance that with future funder requirements? Yeah, um, so I think um, one thing that impressed me when I've been having meetings here is that people seem to have taken a long time to think about what's in their template. And I strongly encourage you to do that. Um, so when in the UK, we kind of went through a transition that all of these different funders had multiple, well, they all had one template, but you know, they, it meant that we had seven or eight different templates that different unis were using. And then universities also introduced their own templates. And most of those were very long. Um, it seemed to me that it was more about, oh, what could we ask? Oh, we could ask that. And there's a million and one things you could ask. So I would really encourage you to think about what you need to ask um, and how you're gonna use every piece of information because you don't want to be asking things just for the sake of it. You want to make sure that you do things with that data that actually a researcher providing you with a piece of information about, you know, like 
the data they'll create or how they will manage it or how they'll um, share it either gets fed off to other systems or informs something you provide back to them. Um, and I think that's really the way to try and keep it minimal. Um, and I would take a lot of time to um, develop that template and test it and develop the guidelines that go with it because the kind of best funded templates um, have seen a number of iterations. So ESRC, for example, they had a template, they've had one for years, um, but they have looked at the DMPs that have come in, they've looked at the responses and they've gone, ah, people are not understanding this question. And then they've revised the question or the guidance. Um, and I think that's an important thing to do. Um, yeah. So take time when you go through the development process. Uh, certainly there's an example, um, the DMP interest group um, previously has heard from the University of Technology Sydney where they have turned their DMP tool. So they're using the, the QCIF Redbox software mm -hmm. um, and, and that uses the DMP as a, as a foundation for future data management description uh, for archiving and for publication. So there's yeah. certainly, which I think is a really great um, method of being able to move from um, a, uh, being able to pivot, I guess, if you will, a um, uh, an administrative form that then can be reused in other circumstances and answering other stakeholder requirements. Um, I wanted to also follow up with a question just note that there was a question in there about changes to the Australian Code for the Responsible Conduct of Research um, yeah. and how to accommodate some of those. I, um, in the Australian context, there has been um, this, this code strongly encourages the use of data management plans, um, although it doesn't necessarily enforce that. However, the authors of that of that code, um, the National Health and Medical Research Council here in Australia, um, have also published a, um, a policy on um, ethical, uh, an ethics policy which requires data management plans for research on human subjects. So mm -hmm. um, there have been questions on how that can be managed, um, especially from the point of view of people who support researchers within a hospital setting who may not necessarily have access to their um, data management. Uh, their, that hospital organisation or their research centre may not necessarily have data management planning uh, infrastructure in place yet. Um, our, our response from the ARDC is that most of those researchers will, will likely have uh, an institutional relationship um, who are required to provide that kind of infrastructure through through the code as a responsibility of institutions. Yeah. Uh, I, yeah, but I wondered if you had any other comment on that in terms of DMPs um, for, um, for, for research that includes human subjects or potentially sensitive and confidential, um, confidential data, does that um, yeah. make things more or less difficult for the sharing and um, progress of DMPs? Yeah, so I mean, I don't know exactly what your ethics requirements are here, but what we see in the UK and Europe is that sometimes there's duplication because what people are asked to do in a DMP can be similar or, you know, fairly close to what they're asked to do within an ethics um, approval um, or like an ethics statement that they have to submit. Um, so I think if certainly if it's been pushed that the projects that have sensitive data are the ones who need to do DMPs, I would strongly encourage trying to align any forms researchers are being asked to fill in um, so they're not then having you know the same set of questions asked twice. Um, I think with um, sensitive data, yeah, it's, it's certainly more critical to make sure that it's handled well, that people are aware of some of the risks um, and make sure that the data is stored appropriately, that it's only shared with relevant people. But also I think with sensitive data, it's much more important that people really do the planning from the outset because if they don't get consent to share or you know if they don't think about that longer term reuse, then often they can't do that. So there might be an expectation from the um, 
Australian funder, a HMRC or whatever they're called, um, that the data is shared. But if people haven't got consent for that, then they're not able to. So I think this is why it's important to consider it early on um, and to include that in the kind of research project design. And um, for sensitive data, yes, it's, you know, there's more restrictions that may need to be placed in terms of the sharing, um, you know, anonymizing the data or having um, data sharing agreements that control who can use the data and for what purposes or, you know, how the data can be accessed. It might be in a secure data service. Um, so these things are important to consider. It doesn't necessarily mean the data can't be shared, um, but it does need more thoughts and more planning. So it's certainly good to, to encourage that early on. Okay, well, thank you very much for that, um, uh, Sarah. And I, um, I'm just going to switch over to uh, some information now in, in terms of wrapping up um, about the data management planning interest group. So, um, so I encourage everyone on this line, if you're not already part of this interest group, you can join our Slack workspace there at uh, uh, choosing that bit.ly link, which will take you to a workspace called Data Librarians, but it's not just for data librarians. And the channel that we have there is called DMP-IG. So we have a current community project on building data management planning advocacy one-pager resources, which are tailored to different share um, stakeholders there. Um, this, this project um, we're going to launch at the Birds of a Feather session, um, the first round of um, one-pagers that we've produced uh, at the eResearch Australasia conference. In, um, on the 21st to the 25th of October in Brisbane this year. Um, that birds of a feather session is quite interesting um, and is certainly being innovative in that it will be a project runway style reality TV um, uh, birds of a feather session where DMPs and their builders will compete for various prizes such as most fair DMP and best demonstration of machine actionable action uh, and other such um, very serious categories. So watch out watch out for that. Uh, and um, I encourage you to join us on, on our Slack channel um, to continue this conversation. So I'll put some of those questions that came in um, through um, into that channel following this um, webinar uh, and we will endeavour to share this webinar with people um, uh, in, the, in the next couple of weeks. Okay, so thanks very much again, Sarah, for sharing with us lessons from Europe and your thoughts on data management, uh, planning, advocacy, and machine actionability. And I mm -hmm. hope everyone has had, um, has had a great time in this last hour. Excellent. Thank you very much. And with that, I guess we're saying goodbye. Bye-bye. <laughs> okay. Bye, everybody. Thanks for joining us.